and the topic is therefore one of my favorites. And I also love talking to anyone, and especially the young, because you are the future. If you have good ideas, you can bring those into your own life and into society around you. What I'm going to say is largely contained in an article that I wrote for Inform, publication of the Catholic Adult Education Center, where, as Michael said, I was the director for nine years. It's called God and Science. It's readily available from the Catholic Adult Education Center. My talk has a little bit more than is in that article, things that have come up in the, in the press and wherever since it was written. And it's a, it's a fascinating topic. And the question is, can you be a scientist and believe in God? Is there any connection between what scientists are finding and belief in God? There are people, as we know, like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens has now gone to God, who would say that you can't be intelligent and believe in God. We don't need God anymore. Scientists have all the answers. And, and other people, as we're going to see, will tell you the very laws of science, of nature, lead us back to God. Much of what I'm going to say is based on this book by John Lennox, professor of mathematics at Oxford, called God's Undertaker. Has science buried God? Question mark. And it was sent to me by a friend. I read the book and I thought, this is so good. Let's write an article on it for Inform. I've been giving talks on it all over, and the more I can give, the better, because I love the topic. While I'm here, there's another book that came out a few years ago by Robert Spitzer. Some of you may recognize his name from EWTN. He's a Jesuit in the US, and the book is entitled New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. And I don't know whether where Robert Spitzer get his, his, his colossal understanding of science, I think from his scientist friends. But having studied science myself, I found much of the science just well beyond me. But there's a lot of truths in this book. If someone has a very scientific, mathematical mind, you'll get a lot out of it. But it is heavy going in the beginning. I think God's undertaker is much more readily accessible to the average mind. <clears throat> well, our science and, and belief in God opposed to one another. Sir Alfred North Whitehead, who died in 1947, British philosopher and mathematician, posed the question of how scientific knowledge could have expanded so quickly in the years leading up to Sir Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, written in 1700. So there was a tremendous advance in science. Why did that come about is what Whitehead was pondering. And he answered, modern science must come from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. Christians believe in a God who is reason, logos. Pope Benedict developed that greatly, as did John Paul II before him. Faith and reason. God is, is reason. God is reasonable. God is rational. God has left us a world which is intelligible. And that is what uh, Whitehead concludes led to the advance in science. And C.S. Lewis says the same. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. The very belief in God as re reason led them to investigate nature and to come up with so many discoveries. Francis Bacon died in 1626, is regarded by many as the father of modern science, and he taught that God has provided us with two books, the book of nature and the book of the Bible. And he considered that a truly educated person should study both. Mathematician, mathematician and astronomer Johannes Kepler, who died in 1630, just four years after Bacon, 
shared the same conviction, as did many of the great scientists since the Renaissance, among them Pascal, Boyle, Newton, Faraday, Mendel, Pasteur, and Kelvin. We should study the law, of the book of nature, and the book of the Bible. And Kepler wrote, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world it should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. So Kepler, obviously a firm believer that that rational order in nature comes from God. In short, it was precisely belief in a rational God who left us a universe that is ordered and can be studied by the human intellect that provided the foundation for the prodigious scientific advances of the last few centuries. Moreover, just as belief in God has aided science, so the study of the laws of nature has led back to belief in God, who is the cause of the order which scientists study. This indeed was one of the five arguments for the existence of God of St. Thomas Aquinas, who died in 1274. And in his Summa Theologiae, he argues from five different aspects of the visible world, the world of nature, to the necessary existence of a cause of those aspects. And one of the proofs starts from order or purpose in nature. And where we find order or purpose, there must be an intelligence behind it, and ultimately the intelligence behind the order and purpose in the universe is God, that supremely intelligent and all-powerful being who made the universe and gave it that order and purpose. Archbishop Michael Sheehan, who was in Sydney for some years, in his popular Apologetics and Catholic Doctrine, which was recently revised by Father Peter Joseph from Sydney, and it was a great contribution to not only republish the book, but revise it extensively. A good part of the new Apologetics and Catholic Doctrine owes its origin to Father Peter. And Sheehan uses the analogy of the camera which has various parts all working together to produce a photograph. No one would say that the camera put itself together by chance. We have a camera out in front of me, and no one would say, oh, it just happened. I had all this plastic and glass and other materials, aluminum in my backyard, and you wouldn't believe it, this storm the other night, I found this camera. The storm put it together. Someone would say, you're mad, but don't, don't worry, we've got psychiatrists can look after you, we've got very fine hospitals, you'll be all right, just relax. Now nobody would say that a camera put itself together by chance. And, and then and Michael Archbishop Sheehan then argues, if the camera needed a designer and a manufacturer, how much more the human eye, which is very similar to a camera, in its functions. Light comes in, there's a shutter if you like, light impinges on the back of the eye, we see images in color and, and size and shape and, and movement. If the camera needed a designer, how much more the human eye? And Sir Isaac Newton, in his book Optics, written in 1721, really says the same. How are the bodies of animals to be contrived with so much art? And for what ends were their natural parts? Was the eye contrived without skill in optics? And the ear without knowledge of sounds? Does it not appear from phenomena that there is a being, which he puts with a capital B, incorporeal, that is without a body, living, intelligent, and he goes on, uh, the, the being that obviously made the eye, made the body. These are the things we have to ponder on and realize this is true. We'll go on, there. you'll find many more arguments as we go through this talk. Contemporary philosopher Richard Swinburne agrees. 
He says, the very success of science in showing us how deeply ordered the natural world is provides strong grounds for believing that there is an even deeper cause for that order. And John Lennox, in this book, God's Undertaker, sums it up. The point to grasp here, he says, is that because God is not an alternative to science as an explanation, he is not to be understood merely as a god of the gaps. On the contrary, he is the ground of all explanation. It is his existence which gives rise to the very possibility of explanation, scientific or otherwise. If, if, in, if nature is intelligible, if it is rational, if it has design, it is because of the ultimate cause who is rational, and that is God. Commenting on the relationship between science and God in his address to the Plenary Assembly of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences on the 28th of October 2010, Pope Benedict XVI said, scientists do not create the world. They learn about it and attempt to imitate it, following the laws and intelligibility that nature manifests to us. The scientist's experience as a human being is therefore that of perceiving a constant, a law, a logos, that he has not created, but that he has instead observed. In fact, it leads us to admit the existence of an all-powerful reason which is other than that of man and which sustains the world. This is the meeting point between the natural sciences and religion. As a result, science becomes a place of dialogue, a meeting between man and nature, and potentially even between man and his creator. Returning to the question we posed at the beginning, and I didn't actually pose it, but now let us pose it, and this is the ultimate question. Has the universe, with its billions of galaxies, each with billions of stars and other bodies, come about through chance, or is it the product of a supremely intelligent and all-powerful designer? There are no alternatives. Either chance, it just happened, or it was put together by a supremely intelligent and all-powerful creator whom we call God. There's no other possibility. And let us be clear that these are the only possibilities. There are people who argue for chance like biologist George Gaylord Simpson, who wrote some years ago that we are the product of a mindless and purposeless natural process which did not have us in mind. He's entitled to that opinion. What do others say? As we saw before, the first thing we notice about the universe is that it is intelligible. There are laws of nature, laws of gravity, etc. <clears throat> this led Albert Einstein, arguably one of the greatest minds of the 20th century, to make the famous statement, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. He went on to say that he considered this comprehensibility a miracle or an eternal mystery since in principle one would expect a chaotic world. If it just happened by chance, it would be chaos. And this chaotic world could not be grasped by the mind. What is more, this miracle quote is being constantly reinforced as our knowledge expands, as we discover more and more the comprehensibility, intelligibility of the universe. He went on to say, my religion, this is Albert Einstein, remember, consists in a humble admiration of the superior, unlimited spirit which is revealed in the minimal details which we are able to perceive with our fragile and weak minds. This conviction, deeply emotional, 
of the presence of a rational superior power which is revealed in the incomprehensible universe forms my idea of God. Einstein looking at the comprehensibility of the universe reasons to the existence of a rational superior power. That's his idea of God. Among the other 20th century scientists who saw a connection between the laws of nature and the mind of God were Max Planck, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrödinger, and Paul Dirac, all in the area of nuclear physics. The fact that the universe can be understood by the human mind has led thinkers down the ages to conclude that the universe itself must be the product of intelligence. As philosopher Keith Ward puts it, to the majority of those who have reflected deeply and written about the origin and nature of the universe, it has seemed that it points beyond itself to a source which is non-physical and of great intelligence and power. Almost all of the great classical philosophers, certainly Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, Kant, Hegel, Locke, Berkeley, saw the origin of the universe as lying in a transcendent reality. That's the end of that quote from the contemporary philosopher Keith Ward, who quotes all of those philosophers that, whose names are familiar to us as seeing the origin of the universe lying in a transcendental reality. Stephen Hawking, well known for his book, The Brief History of Time, was it? Um, and in his wheelchair, suffering from motor neuron disease, which normally ends your life within two or three years. He's a living miracle, I suppose, the fact that he's still alive. And he occupies the professorial chair once held by Sir Isaac Newton at Cambridge. He is not known for his belief in God, but he once admitted in a television interview, it is difficult to discuss the beginning of the universe without mentioning the concept of God. My work on the origin of the universe is on the borderline between science and religion, but I try to stay on the scientific side of the border. It is quite possible that God acts in ways that cannot be described by scientific laws. That was earlier, and let me just give you the date of that interview, 1989, a long time ago. In his latest book, The Grand Design, he argues that God is not needed to create the universe. And in a passage which was excerpted in the Times of London, he wrote, and this is from that book, The Grand Design, I will preface this by saying it is one of the most extraordinary statements by a very intelligent person that I have ever read. This is the statement from Hawking. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. Out of nothing has come something. And not only something, but this vast universe with all of its design, harmony, complexity, it all came about from nothing, given the law of gravity. And one might ask, excuse me, when there was nothing, where was the law of gravity? There's nothing. Spontaneous creation. I have to say again, that is the most extraordinary statement I've ever seen from an intelligent person. I don't understand it. Maybe I have to read the book, which I haven't. I have to admit that. But something coming out of nothing, and not only something, but something ordered, and something enormous like the universe coming out of nothing, 
doesn't correspond to my understanding of the laws of logic and, and of nature. However, let us go on. One of the extraordinary aspects of the universe is that it seems not only to be ordered, but fine-tuned to support life, and human life in particular. And this has come to be known as the anthropic principle from anthropos, the Greek word for man. This is the conclusion of scientists, of philosophers, who ponder the fact that the universe does have life. Remember that on this planet we are alive, there is much life, and there's always that great search for life outside of the planet Earth. And so far they haven't found it. They have found some evidence of perhaps water or ice, but nothing really alive, and certainly not intelligent life. But here we have life, and we have intelligent life in human beings. And what the scientists and the philosophers are, are seeing is that the necessary conditions for any planet, any universe to have life are so extraordinary. A whole series of constants in nature, the law of gravity, the nuclear magnetic force, strong and weak, etc., are exactly what they need to be to support life, and that is to begin with, to have carbon, which is formed under very precise conditions. If the nuclear ground state energy levels necessary for the formation of carbon varied by more than 1%, the universe could not sustain life. This led prominent mathematician and astronomer Sir Frederick Hoyle, and we'll come back to him a couple of more times, to confess that nothing had shaken his atheism as much as this discovery, that all these conditions are just right to support life, and that it looked as if, quote, a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces in nature worth talking about. There has to be design, this atheist is concluding. Looking at more obvious facts, the distance of the Earth from the Sun is just right to support life. Any nearer and it would be too hot. Any farther away and everything would freeze. A change of some 2% would mean the end of all life in the distance of the Earth from the Sun. Likewise, surface gravity and temperature have to be within a few percent of what they are for the life-sustaining atmosphere to have the right mix of gases necessary for life. And the planet must rotate at just the right speed. Too slow and the temperature differences between day and night would be too extreme, too fast, and wind speeds would be catastrophic. And these are arguments that Lennox gives in his book, God's Undertaker. In their efforts to explain away the cause of this fine-tuning of the universe, some scientists have proposed the multiverse theory, according to which there are many, possibly infinitely many, parallel universes. If the, the probability of all these conditions being exactly what they are to support life on this, in this universe are so remote, so infinitesimal, the probability, well, maybe there's a million universes. Then you start to get perhaps some meaningful, meaningful probability. But this is fanciful. There's no evidence for any other universes. Whatever that might mean, universe means the sum total of all that is. R Philosopher Richard Swinburne sums it up with a touch of humor. To postulate a trillion trillion other universes rather than one God in order to explain the orderliness of our universe seems the height of irrationality. And now I come to a statement that I make with total conviction. An atheist has far more faith than I do. I have enough faith to believe in God as the cause of this universe and its order and complexity and purpose 
I, for the life of me, do not have enough faith to believe that nothing brought this about. That is a blind faith, a step in the dark, to believe somehow that all of this came about by sheer chance and that nothing created something. That is an act of faith I can't make. These atheists have far more faith than I do. Perhaps the most well-known statement on design in nature comes from the 18th century naturalist and theologian William Paley. He says that if asked why a stone came to be lying on the ground, one might answer that perhaps it had lain there forever. But if he found a watch on the ground, such an answer would be absurd. The watch must have had a maker. There must have existed an artificer who formed it for the purpose which we find it actually to answer, who comprehended its construction and designed its use. Every indication of contrivance, every manifestation of design which existed in the watch, exists in the works of nature, with the difference on the side of nature of being greater or more, and that in a degree which exceeds all computation. So we see William Paley back in the 18th century arguing the same as Archbishop Michael Sheehan. If the watch, if the camera needed a designer, all the more the design that we find in nature. Does not the order in nature necessarily require a designer who is intelligent and powerful, some would argue no. Even Charles Darwin had great admiration for Paley's argument until he discovered the law of natural selection, which for him explained the evolution and design of living things. Perhaps it was Darwin more than anyone else who put the nail in God's coffin in some people's minds by arguing that with natural selection there is no longer a need to believe in God. For him and many other scientists, we no longer need God as the designer of nature. Unguided, mindless, evolutionary processes can do it all. One thing that we should know though about Darwin is that in his Origin of Species, which is the main work on natural selection and evolution, in the front page, he has two quotations, both from believers, and that he himself, at the end of that book, writes that he thinks that his explanation of natural selection is most in keeping with the idea of a God, something to that effect. One of my columns in the Catholic Weekly, after the debate between Cardinal Pell and Richard Dawkins, was on that question and whether Darwin himself believed in God. One of the things that uh, we were all happy to read in the last month or so is that Charles Darwin's great, great, great granddaughter is now working for Catholic Voices in London to, to spread and, and defend the Catholic faith. And another thing I heard just in the last few weeks is that Christ Christopher Hitchens' nephew is a, is a Catholic and uh, a very active one in the church. So good things are happening. Now let us look at the question of evolution and God. Would it be the case that if you believe in evolution, you can't believe in God? Or are they compatible? Does evolution therefore exclude the need for God? Richard Dawkins thinks that it does. He writes using his famous description of the blind watchmaker that goes back to Paley. The only watchmaker in nature is the blind forces of physics. Natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation for the existence, Darwin never said that, the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life has no purpose in mind. If it can be said to play the role of watchmaker in nature, it is that of the blind watchmaker. But there are problems with this. First, 
natural selection presupposes the existence of life and the existence of the universe before life. How did the universe come to be in order for it later to evolve? We have to look back at the cause of the very universe and the life which is later evolving. Secondly, while the process of natural selection is itself blind and purposeless, it follows the laws of nature written into living things. Where do these laws come from? And why are there laws instead of chaos? Laws, fixed patterns of behavior, simply do not result from chaos or chance. The laws in nature that provide for some evolution are already written there by the intelligent lawgiver. At this point, it's helpful to distinguish what we mean by evolution or natural selection. And when someone asks, do you believe in evolution? The next question from us is, well, what do you mean by that? If we mean that over time there will emerge variations in the individuals of a given species, and that some of these variants will be better adapted for survival than others and will therefore tend to predominate in the population, what could be called microevolution, then there's no argument. This phenomenon was observed by Darwin and it is an established scientific fact that there is a gradual evolution within species. Some variants are better adapted at survival, they predominate, the other ones die out, survival of the fittest. That is a fact within species, microevolution. If, however, we mean that one form of life will over time gradually evolve into higher and very different forms of life, what could be called macroevolution, then we are no longer in the realm of scientifically, scientifically proven fact, but rather in that of theory. And we come back to our good friend Sir Frederick Hoyle, who died in 2001, I think it was, and he was uh, an atheist or a non-believer. Whether he died a believer, I would think he might have, from all the things that he wrote. He comments on macroevolution. Well, as common sense would suggest, the Darwinian theory is correct in the small, but not in the large. Rabbits come from other slightly different rabbits, not from either primeval soup or potatoes. Where they come from in the first place is a problem, problem yet to be solved, like much else of a cosmic scale. Very importantly, the fossil record does not show evidence of the gradual transition from one form of life to another. Darwin himself admitted that the lack of fossils of intermediate varieties, quote, perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. Will we find when we look back millions of years fossils that are gradually evolving into higher forms of life? Over a century after Darwin, evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould, who is one of the most even eminent evolutionary biologists, comments on the lack of fossil evidence. And this is a quote from him. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. They haven't form found these transitional forms, but they keep it a secret. Moreover, he notes that the fossil record shows two features which are particularly inconsistent with the idea that species gradually evolved. One is stasis, S-T-A-S-I-S, -S, a Greek word, the fact that most species show no directional change during their time on Earth. Quote, they appear in the fossil record looking pretty much the same as when they disappear. Morphological change, that is change in their structure, is usually limited and directionless. Stasis, they remain the same. There's a static uh, state in, of these fossils between when they first appear and when they disappear from the fossil record. The other phenomenon is sudden appearance. And Stephen J. Gould says, in any local area, a species does not, arise does not arise gradually by the steady transformation of its ancestors. It appears all at once and fully formed. 
So suddenly you, p you find in the fossil record the new appearance of some form, fully formed. Even if scientists should one day be able to show conclusively that evolution does take place from one form of life to another, radically different one, this will still not do away with the need for God. It will simply mean that God created life in the first place and that he wrote into its genetic code the plan for its eventual evolution into other forms. In short, God and evolution are compatible. Francis Collins, director of the Human Genome Project, likes to refer to this as biologos. Bios, the realm of the living, through logos, word, mind, or intelligence. So even if there is evolution from apes to humans and whatever else along the way, God wrote that into the genetic code right from the beginning. In this regard, Pope Benedict XVI, in a conversation with Italian priests in 2007, spoke of the debate raging between creationism and evolutionism, presented as though these were mutually exclusive alternatives. As if, quote, those who believe in the Creator would not be able to conceive of evolution, and those who instead support evolution would have to exclude God. This antithesis is absurd because on the one hand there are so many scientific proofs in favor of evolution which appears to be a reality we can see and which enriches our knowledge of life and being as such. But on the other, the doctrine of evolution does not answer every query, especially the great philosophical question, where does everything come from? And how did everything start which ultimately led to man? Yes, there is some degree of evolution, but it had to have a beginning, and that beginning is God, is what the Pope is implying in what he says. One of the biggest problems, though, for those who don't believe in God is the origin of life. This is one of those really unanswered questions from the scientific point of view. If you look at the time frame of the existence of the universe, it's just been lengthened by about 0.1 of a billion years in the last few months, so it's now out to 13.8 billion years, the, the length of existence of the universe. And life, it seems, appeared about 3.5 billion years ago. So something like 10 billion years after the creation of the universe came the first living thing. How did it come about? Because all you've got is the non-living, you've got molecules bouncing around, and suddenly life appeared. It did. It's here. We are alive. We're talking about it. How did all of this begin? That is a great question. Microbiologist Michael Denton, who was teaching at UNSW when he wrote his book Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, and he says, by the way, at the beginning of that book, that he is not a believer. That is, he doesn't belong to any particular religion. But he writes this book, Evolution, a Theory in Crisis. And he says that the break between the non-living and the living represents the most dramatic and fundamental of all the discontinuities in nature. Between a living cell and the most highly ordered non-biological system, such as a crystal or a snowflake, there is a chasm as vast and absolute as it is possible to conceive. He describes the complexity of even the tiniest of bacterial cells weighing less than a trillionth of a gram as, quote, a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man, and absolutely without parable, parallel in the non-living world. And that's just one tiny bacterial cell. What is more, the factory can reproduce its entire structure in a matter of hours. Denton goes on to ask whether such a factory could possibly have resulted from chance. 
Now we're not talking about a camera or a watch. We are talking about something living, far more complex than any machine that man can make. Could this have resulted from chance? He, he says, is it really credible that random processes could have constructed a reality, the smallest element of which a functional protein or gene is complex beyond our own creative capacities, a reality which is the very antithesis of chance, which excels in every sense anything produced by the intelligence of man. Is it possible that chance threw that up? Microbiologist Michael Bay adds, to a person who does not feel obliged to restrict his search to unintelligent causes, the straightforward conclusion is that many biochemical systems were designed. I don't know why he says many, but they were all designed. They were designed not by the laws of nature, not by chance and necessity. Rather, they were planned. Life on Earth, at its most fundamental level, in its most critical components, is the product of intelligent activity. And now we come back to our good friend, Sir Frederick Hoyle, and his colleague, mathematician Chandra Wickramasinghe. And in the, the 1980s, they were pondering this question, how did life begin? And having some basic understanding of what was involved in the simplest living one-celled organism, how many amino acids, how many proteins, how do they have to put themselves together so that they will be alive and able to reproduce and eventually evolve. They knew more or less the structure of this one-celled living organism and they set out to calculate the probability that this could result by chance, just from the bouncing of, and they started with amino acids. And I would say that's cheating, Sir Fred. Don't start with amino acids. Start with carbon dioxide, water vapor, nitrogen, perhaps ammonia gas in the prehistoric soup, as they call the atmosphere. But they started with amino acids. They're already way ahead of us. And what are the chances that the amino acids will put themselves together in just the right configuration to be alive? They came up with the, prob the probability of 1 in 10 to the 40,000th. 1 in 10 with 40,000 zeros after it. And they realized, atheists as they were, that this couldn't have happened. There's no possibility of that. Ho Hoyle is credited with the famous statement, the chance that life produced its, put itself together by chance in the prehistoric soup is about as great as a wind blowing through a junkyard producing a 747. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And therefore, they concluded there had to be a creator of life. Creator. Now we would say they're believing in God. No, a super intellect in outer space created life and sent it to Earth. And we would say, Sir Fred, congratulations, you have found God. And he would say, no, no, super intellect. Well, that's what we mean by God. The one who created life is, is God. More recently, philosopher Anthony Flew gave us a reason for his conversion to belief in God after 50 years of atheism that the study of DNA has shown, quote, by the most unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved. And he has that beautiful little book, fairly short, after the many books he had written on atheism. He has this little book that is entitled, when you look at the cover, it, it says in print, there is no God. And then no is crossed out, and above it is written by hand, ah, there is a God. And it was the study of science, of DNA, that led this, this professed and, and very widely written and, and read atheist to conclude there had to be a God. One final question. This is not in most of the books, but it one that we have to include because it is a philosophical question, very simple to understand, that tells us, in addition to all we've already seen, 
that there has to be a God. And that is the fact that we humans have rational intelligence. Of all the living beings, only man, and of course angels and God himself, have a spiritual soul, a rational intelligence capable of even questioning the existence of God. Where does this spirit, spiritual power come from? Spirit does not evolve from matter. Matter is one thing, spirit is another. Spirit can only come from other spirit. And ultimately, it is the, the first supreme, pure spirit who is God, who gave the spiritual life, the spirit, the intelligence, to human beings and angels. And that very fact argues necessarily to belief in God. And I like to put this in the form of a, of a syllogism which has several steps, unlike Descartes' I think, therefore I am. This one reads, I deny that God exists, therefore he exists. Now, that, the second statement doesn't follow immediately from the first, but it does after a series of intermediate statements. I deny that God exists, therefore I have within me a spiritual power, a rational intelligence capable of formulating the very idea of God and the idea of existence. Apes in Taronga Park Zoo are not pondering whether God exists. They don't have the concept of God or the concept of existence. They live, they have a brain, they have intelligence, but they don't have rational intelligence. If I can deny that God exists, I have a, a spiritual power, a rational intelligence, capable of formulating the very idea of God and the idea of existence and non-existence. If I have this spiritual power, it must have come from somewhere. It could not have come from matter. It must have come from some other spirit. And the ultimate cause of everything spiritual is the very God whose existence I deny. I tried that with Patrick Madrid when he was here and he, he liked it. In fact, reading his book, The Godless Delusion, he argues in a very similar way. So I think we're on very solid ground when we say that. The very existence of human beings already argues necessarily for a God who is pure spirit that gave us the spiritual life that we have. Well, we'll finish with that, and I hope you will agree after all of this that a scientist can well and truly believe in God. There is no incompatibility between science and what science shows us and belief in God. So thank you very much. Did anybody want to ask a question? <laughs> oh, we do. Oh, just before you go, guys. Sorry. Um, Father John just asked if there was any questions. Does anyone want to ask? Yes. Um, yeah, you mentioned the watchmaker analogy and the shortcomings of Darwin's response to that. Um, what would you say to David Hume's argument, who stated that the only way we can appreciate the complexity of a watch is if we have, um, if, is if we can compare it to other um, objects such as you know, a pile of bricks or a pile of metal. Um, and similarly, the only way we can appreciate the complexity of the universe is if we had other universes to compare it to. Um, obviously, we can imagine other universes or other possible worlds, but we're only going to fill those imagined worlds with what we already know from this world. Um, how would you respond to Dave Hume's argument? Personally, I don't see why we need to compare it with anything. If someone gives me a computer, and I look at that and they show me what it does, I don't need to compare that with anything. It, it in itself has beauty, has order, purpose, and functionality that I would never have dreamed of. I don't have that problem myself. 
Um, I don't know if anyone else here does, but I don't need to compare something with something else. When somebody gives me the first computer or the first camera or the first anything, I will say what, how marvelous this is in itself. And I suppose we are um, inadvertently or not uh, in, in necessarily, but we're, we, are, we are comparing it with what we thought might exist or what we have known to exist before. And, um, but personally, if, if someone shows me life and shows me the, uh, that description that Michael Denton gives of a cell, there's a much longer description that um, Lennox quotes in his book. And when you read that, just to look at that, you're just full of awe. You don't have to see anything else. You're just full of awe at this complexity and, and, and purpose. And um, so uh, I personally, I don't need to compare anything uh, myself. Maybe I'm illogical, but uh, I'm in awe at, at, at anything as beautiful as, as life or as a human being, for that matter. Look at just the human body. And you've got a digestive system. You've got a respiratory system. You've got an immune system. You have a reproductive system. Did that just happen? I was with a friend on Monday watching the whales go up the coast. And we saw these, these two that were reasonably close in. And you could see the, the, the black uh, back of the whale and lots of splashing. And, and we were just, I, I just raised the question, isn't it mark remarkable, the instinct? That, that whales have, because every year tens of thousands of whales make the long journey up from Antarctica and the, and the Southern Ocean up to Queensland to, to breed and then they swim back again. And, uh, and if you think in, in terms of evolution, maybe a whale evolves from, from something else, but why should it have instinct? Why should it have instinct to, to leave where it is and swim all the way up the coast and then breed up there where it's warmer and then come back down and do that year after year. The, the whole notion of instinct in animals is something extraordinary. And for me, it, it bespeaks the intelligent designer <laughs> who gave it to them so that they will survive. What else? I think we have to leave some time from morning to yes. Um, so you said that Earth is fine-tuned to support human life. But what if another form of life um, needs a different set of conditions to live in. Well, it's fine-tuned to support all life because it, it can produce carbon. And this is a whole, it's a more developed argument when you look at all those constants that they describe. Some of them, if they were out by even, not, not just one percent, but out by a hundredth of a percent, any one of them out by a hundred, hundredth of a percent or one percent would, would render it impossible for the Earth to support any life at all. But uh, the question is, is um, not whether it's human life or some other form of life, but life at all requires all these factors, all these constants to be virtually exactly what they are. And when these philosophers and scientists look at that, they're in absolute awe that everything is exactly right. So uh, whether it's one form of life, human or another, it doesn't make any difference. Life as we know it, I mean, maybe there's some other form of, of life, but um, life as we know it on, on Earth requires all these things to be exactly right. And it's, um, it's a more recent development, I guess, the anthropic uh, discovery, maybe going back a few decades, I'm not sure. What else? Sorry, um, I just wanted to ask if you could explain what the boundaries of science are, so scientific yeah. inquiry, what the boundaries of that are. Um, and why the Christian faith, or most faiths in God, are not contingent on that. Um, I find that a lot of the time, some of your more pop scientific atheists seem to think that the term you mentioned was God of the gaps, yeah. that Christians believe in a God of the gaps, and as soon as they find something to fill that gap, that aha, you know, yeah. there you go, obviously you're wrong. Yeah. Um, can you explain that? Well, the, the boundaries of science are the observable. So whatever you can observe with some measurement, whether it's, it's optical, you can see something, you can touch it, you can feel it. And then, of course, with, um, with modern um, uh, machinery of uh, ultrasound and nuclear magnetic resonance, etc., you can look at all sorts of aspects of nature that we could never observe on our own, but always within the, the, the realm of the observable by some means. And 
that's as far as science can go. And it, it really, scientists are not the ones to be telling us, well, how did this all begin in the first place? They can say how, how old the universe is, what it looked like at the beginning, extrapolating back from what we know now, and they extrapolate back to the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And you should know that the, the first one to come up with the concept of the Big Bang was a Catholic priest. Uh, I think it was Father Le Met, something like that, a, a Belgian back in the 1930s. And now that's the, the prevailing notion of how old the universe is. It all began with this molten mass, or this a mass of matter that just blew apart and it's been expanding ever since. So the, the scientists can tell us how old it is, what it was like at the beginning, but how it came to be like that is beyond the scientific. That, that becomes the realm of the philosopher or to some extent the theologian, if God has revealed it. It's more philosophical. So science is limited. And often you find the scientists playing philosopher. They don't realize that they're stepping beyond their own realm of, of expertise to start to postulate whether there's a god or not. That's not the realm of scientists. They just look at what is and tell us how it works and, and whatnot. Um, one more or time for morning tea? One more. So far I've been fudging along with some, some answers that hopefully are, are pretty close to <laughs> accurate. As a father, you mentioned that apes um, and such creatures have intelligence but not rational intelligence. What is the extent of the intelligence of non-rational creatures? Okay, now very good question and this is one that we should all be very clear on. Uh, you, you study this or I studied it in a subject called um, Was it, um, well, you'd call it philosophical anthropology today, but the whole question of whether apes might just be the same as us, except we're a bit more intelligent than they are. And how do we know that they don't have rational intelligence, and we do? Because we can't communicate with them in, in, in words, so we can't go over to the zoo and, and, and engage them in conversation. But one of the arguments that convinced me, and it's the simplest one, I have a simple mind, by the way, so I need pretty basic um, ideas. And it's the idea of progress. And that is, if you observe apes, let's say the, the gorillas, I, I, I look at the gorillas or the uh, chimpanzees at the zoo, and they're just fascinating. They have in common with us a lot. They eat, they play, they, they wrestle. There's that motherly instinct suckling the, the young one. Um, there's a certain affective life that they have in common with us. That's all part of our, of our nature, but that we have in common with animals. What they don't have in common with us is that rational intelligence that allows us to progress and they don't. So if you observe apes in the jungle, uh, well, at, at what point have you seen them begin to make swings, begin to make fire, begin to make a wheel, begin to make paintings on, on the walls, let alone write literature or, uh, or, or write music or make musical instruments or make just a bow and arrow for heaven's sake, a boomerang. Any ape can make a boomerang, but they don't because they're not thinking. They're just living according to their instincts, the way God designed them, the way they have always lived, and the way they will always continue to live. Man has rational intelligence. He can think, and he can say, I can make fire, I can make a wheel, I can make a cart. And now we're flying to the moon and back, and we're sending spacecraft to explore Mars, and who knows what the limits of this are in the future. So. We have a rational intelligence, and the evidence of that, one of the most obvious elements, is, is progress. And then music and art and technology and whatnot. And they don't have it. The highest apes do not have this. And um, St. Thomas Aquinas, when he, when he looks at beings and how we know what their nature is, he says, beings are known by their operations. So, by their, so we, we observe their operations, their, their, their movement, their, their doings, their operations, their, their, um, what they yeah, manage to, 
to do with themselves. And so you, you watch apes for hundreds of years, you're not going to see any, any sign of rational intelligence. You watch humans and you see it. Maybe we should break so you have time for... So many thanks for, uh, for this, and um, I, I recommend this book, God's Undertaker. New proofs for the existence of God is a bit more daunting. I found it really heavy going in some parts, but there was a lot of very good information there. One of which, by the way, is, um, is an answer to St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa, speaks about the possibility that the universe always existed. It, he says it needs a creator depends totally on, on God in, for its origin, but it may have always been here. And, and Spitzer shows from arguments, especially of, of mathematics, it cannot possibly have always been here. While you can have infinity in time into the future, something can go on and on and on in time, it cannot go on and on and on into the past. If there is time now, it had to have a beginning that you can read to discover why that is so. But um, I found that fascinating. So anyway, um, and then this, the article in Form, God and Science, number 127, available from the Catholic Adult Education Center. That would be a, a very simple form of this. And not everything that I said is in the article, but most of it is. OK, thank you very much. <coughs>